Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of The Internationalist. I'm Tanya, and today I will be speaking to the acclaimed journalist and writer, Vincent Bevins, who's most notable for his 2020 book, The Jakarta Method, and he's also contributed to publications such as Folia de Saulo Paulo, The Atlantic, The Guardian, among others. Thank you so much for joining us today, Vincent. Yeah, thank you for having me. Our conversation today revolves around uh, Vincent's second book, which released in October of last year, called If We Burn, The Masked Protest Decade and the Missing Revolution, where he details and examines protests, including the Arab Spring and the uprisings in Turkey and Hong Kong, and how these movements shaped and continue to shape our recent times. So to begin our discussion today, Vincent, I wanted to first ask you the question that immediately jumped at me as I read your book, which is how social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter during the times of mass protests, be it in Brazil or Turkey, have undoubtedly provided avenues for citizen journalism and amplification of grassroots movements. I mean, we saw that in India when the farmers movement happened in 2021. And in your opinion, um, how can journalism navigate this landscape effectively to harness the benefits of social media activism while mitigating the risks associated with misinformation and sensationalism? Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I think that social media undoubtedly played a role in the mass protests of the 2010s that my book analyzes. And so in my book, in order to be included in the, the history that I build, um, a mass protest must have gotten so big as to overthrow or fundamentally destabilize an existing government. And any time that this happens, I think you have to have multiple causality. There's always three, four, five, six things behind um, that kind of protest um, explosion. And I think social media is one of the things that gets you over the line in many of the cases, probably in all the cases, one of the, the multiple causes. And this was seen as a really great thing uh, early in the 2010s, especially by people like me in Western media. Um, as the decade wore on, it became more clear how um, this could be sort of a poison chalice, how how social media makes some things possible, but makes other things possible too um, that are not so positive for progressive um, political movements. So to answer your question more directly, I'm personally not convinced that social media activism actually exists. Um, and that might, but at the same time, social media is a very important tool for activists and everybody else to use. And that might seem like a, um, a small distinction, and, and it is a small distinction, but I think it ends up being quite important because I think a lot of people in the 2010s, perhaps me included, made the mistake of confusing visibility with victory. Um, the idea held somehow, you know, deep in the subconscious was if everybody sees what we're doing and is convinced that it's good, that must somehow help. Um, and it can, but it must not. I mean, there is, you can imagine cases where the entire world sees that something very bad is happening, disagrees with it. You get maximum awareness, but without any outcome. And I think um, Gaza is a, is a pretty decent, um, uh, example of this dynamic. So what I would say is that social media is a huge part of what everybody does now, not only journalists, not only activists, but everybody. <laughs> for better or worse, I think often for worse, we're kind of living on social media. So what emerges out of this decade as a set of sort of lessons to, to get back to what you're actually asking is one, do not confuse visibility with victory. Two, be very aware of the ways that social media is constituted. And this, I think they're very imperfect and hopefully we don't have to accept this particular type of constitution for a long time, but they are set up to keep people as engaged for as long as possible so that they can be shown advertisements. And social media algorithms have determined often also subconsciously what kind of stuff keeps people glued to their phones. And that's often moral outrage, shock, or often things that make them feel bad about themselves and, and feel like that they have to be there or else they'll miss out on something important. So these are all negative dynamics, but <laughs> um, the third answer that I would give is to pay very close attention to those dynamics and think of the ways that you can use them strategically to get to do what you want to do. So getting your message out is something that will probably require social media. But I'm reminded of an old Noam Chomsky interview where he says that, and he's talking about 20th century corporate mainstream journalism, that often the best practitioners sort of play it like a violin, sort of use it against itself. Um, 
find ways that social media, which is set up to do quite a lot of bad things, can be used in a very narrow way to get something good done for you. And that might mean not falling for all of the other traps that it lays for you. So you don't, you don't have to do every single thing that social media seems to be asking you to do, but to pay close attention to what it can actually uh, achieve for your for your movement. And I think we're particularly seeing um, this right now as we sort of witness a genocide going on in Palestine and the way social media algorithms are catering to sort of you know, what I said about misinformation, peddling misinformation, also peddling certain kinds of players uh, who've been very vocal uh, during this really difficult time. And uh, one word, I mean, that you that stuck out to me in what you've said is visibility also, um, that do not mistake visibility for victory. And I was also wondering how well that ties into uh, my second question, which is about participation of mm -hmm. people in certain movements, whether it's on online or whether it's offline in protests. And what I often see as somebody who's been a participant, you know, all throughout my student years in protests and even right now is the class division that happens, even if you are raising your voice, say on Twitter or X now, or um, your, you know, any kind of activism that you are doing, it does sort of involve this complexity of your class background and where you come from, if you are able to risk your life and livelihood um, on, on such a broad platform, so to speak. And I have personally have seen people getting arrested as they are protesting in Delhi, right? Um, and it sort of brings me to this question about, you know, what do you think of this demographic of protesters? You've covered it in, you know, various urban areas, you know, in Sao Paulo, in Hong Kong. And do you think this demographic holds broader implications for these social movements and, you know, the objectives that they want to achieve? Oh, yes, absolutely. This is the class composition of the uprisings that I looked at matter quite a lot in ways that were often ignored, um, perhaps even intentionally by uh, media narratives. Um, so in the 2010s, and, and the in the class composition of the revolts matter not just for the tactical forms that they ended up taking but also for their outcomes the things that they push for the things that they could actually possibly achieve um and so often in the 2010s especially the one the the set of revolts that i look at the middle class elements take center stage um so often um demographically empirically there is high middle class participation but often more importantly than that middle the middle class is put at the center of the story by people like me in the global media um and people in the western media in the 2010s really love this right because the middle class is sort of the the privileged subject of history for english-speaking liberal media um the idea that this is the young middle class revolt rather than one that is working class or one that is very uh, aligned with any particular interest uh, was was something that allowed for the positive reinforcement loop that I think was often actually necessary for the scaling up of these protests to happen so rapidly. So global media loved the idea that they were middle class and they often were middle class to some extent, even while the people, as you say, that were really taking a lot of the biggest risks and going to jail or dying happened to be urban like youth, people um, living close to the result, uh, the revolts that were not educated or middle class that were like pe perhaps even people living on the streets. Often the people dying were sort of a from like marginalized sectors, not even the working class, but like marginalized sectors of the population. And often in the cases where the revolt actually succeeds, it's because of labor action somewhere. So unions are uh, and, and labor action are very important in stories like Tunisia and Egypt and South Korea. In Chile, even though they're not at the center of the story that is told uh, in global media. And as to the effects on tactics and outcomes, a Turkish sociologist, uh, Gian Tuyal, has wrote a really good article in 2015 called Elusive Revolt about this ex exact dynamic, which I really recommend. Uh, a lot more happens after this article comes out, but he's really, I think he's really getting to the heart of a lot of what happens. And what he says is that there is an elective affinity, an elective affinity between the middle class elements of the revolt 
and sort of individualized and aestheticized forms of protest. Um, and one like example that struck, you know, hit home with me is that he said that the permanent assembly, which was often like a form favored by 2010's protests, is something that like is basically a permanent grad seminar. It's like something that people that are trained to talk and like talking and like hearing themselves talk, people like me will really gravitate towards. Whereas a lot of other people in society are not talk, they don't they don't love talking all day long. They want to participate in the struggle uh, in a different way, or more importantly, they really care about the outcome. And so he often uh, points to a split between protests that that um, gravitate to more formal or institutional uh, concerns like corruption, rather than actual uh, 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 outcomes that change the material conditions of people. And this is often what working class people cared more about. So in the case of Brazil, the main the main um, the main narrative in my book it starts about bus fare rises which is something that really matters to working class people in Brazil. But as more and more middle class people show up, these are people that don't take the bus and they focus on more abstract, aestheticized or um, um, institutional formal goals like corruption uh, and the change of rules uh, at the national level. So I definitely think going forward, uh, we have to continue to pay attention to class in a way that would have it seemed very, very natural in the 20th century. But a lot of people in the 2010s love to say, oh, no, no, there's no more class anymore. It's just a middle class. Uh, the middle class is all that exists. And that's all we have to think about. Ideology is gone. Class is gone. I think both those things turned out to be uh, misleading, if not dangerous. And I mean, India is no stranger to this concept also that, you know, there is no class and, you know, especially during the times of protests, we are one, but it's, it, you can, you see this, um, that this notion was not really present when um, the farmers protests happened in 2021, because the majority of the people mobilizing and organizing came from the farming class, the working class and um, the middle classes, uh, because um, they had barricaded the borders of Delhi where they wanted to march into the protesters. Uh, we could see like the middle class, they were just confined to an area um, within the city and um, not a lot of violence was being seen in that area where everybody had collected but whereas on the borders where the protesters were sort of uh, organizing um you saw barricades you got tear uh, tear gas i mean you see it right now because they're again marching towards delhi as we speak and uh, the protesters have been barricaded again um uh so um, I was recently also, while I was reading your book, I was also reading this another book by Wendy Brown, Nihilistic mm. Times. And uh, I was reading her chapter about a charismatic leader. She was sort of um, going off Max Weber's, um, you know, uh, speech, the 1919 speech on uh, politics as a vocation, where he'd examined uh, why we need a charismatic leader. And she was sort of, um, you know, answering him in a way, sort of working through his speech. And she also advocated for a uh, charismatic leader and why it's really important in our times. Um, and then in your book, um, you state in how the umbrella movement in Hong Kong, you know, was often described as leaderless. And there were many localists there, part of the protest in Hong Kong, who advocated for removing leaders mm -hmm. or leadership structures and just rejecting traditional symbols of authority. So do these dynamics between having a leader as opposed to having a leaderless movement impact overall trajectory and outcomes of movements at all? Yeah, absolutely. And there, there, this, this question of leaderlessness, leaderfulness, decentralization, representation uh, is really at the heart of, of my book. Um, and, and, and that's not because I wanted to put it there. It's because I interviewed 200, 250 people, and this is the answer that I got most often as to why something didn't go the way that they wanted it to the, the 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 most often the the most common answer i got left right and center was we were too decentralized we believe too much in leaderlessness um before i get to that i want to yeah what you mentioned about the the dynamic of protests in india although i haven't looked closely at the the, the, the protest there it reminds me of a lot of what i saw um in my work there is a real unfortunate but real tendency among media to pay much more attention to protests and to repression when there are middle class students involved in the center of big capitals than when this same thing kind of happens 
outside of cities and there are either working class or marginalized um, um, people involved. So for example, in Chile, you have Mapuche revolts happening throughout the entire, um, the same set of years that in which student protesters are um, engaging in actions in downtown Santiago. Media pay a lot of attention to the student protesters, very little attention to the Mapuche protesters who are outside of the big cities and are not seen as, they, they are not the kinds of victims of police repression whose death or uh, uh, um, 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 wh whose death shocks the public consciousness in the way that the middle class uh, uh, violence against the middle class does. So this is unfortunately this is again these are one of these elements of of media that you are, are problem and there's nothing you, you can't change it by uh, snapping your fingers. But I suppose being aware of uh, of, of the limitations of meaning in the senses is, is, is always going to be useful going forward. So how is it that it came to be that so many of these protests in the 2010s were said to be leaderless and that they were celebrated as such? And, and, and was that good or bad, essentially? Um, I think that this particular type of configuration of movements helped in some ways at getting quite a lot of people onto the streets at making it difficult for authorities to understand or control or to stop uprisings um, at getting that positive reinforcement loop from media that often was required to getting more and more people on the streets quickly um, and then that huge amount of people ended up generating real opportunities um, but what was what we saw tragically across the decade is that um, that particular configuration of a movement, one that is said to be leaderless or spontaneous or horizontally structured, failed over and over to take advantage of those opportunities. And often they they watched uh, in horror as somebody else, somebody worse, took advantage of those opportunities. So I think that this concrete leaderlessness comes about as a result of both ideological and material factors. So on the one hand, in many countries around the world, and this varies um, depending on the national context, but it's a generalized tendency, I think. A lot of the types of organizations that would have carried out different types of movements in the 20th century had been crushed, repressed, or um, really re weakened in the era of neoliberalism. So unions, political parties, civil society associations were either weakened um, or crushed by you know the, the types of authoritarian governments we saw in North Africa. So a, 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 an apparently leaderless protest was the easiest, often seeming even the, as the natural way to respond to injustice often in the 2010s. And this is celebrated by some people because there were some pre-existing ideological elements. It wasn't that everyone thought this, but there were some people that thought, well, this is a good thing. And often it was people like me that thought this was a good thing. Now, but what happens in these moments of opportunity generated when, okay, everybody's joined the movement. Everybody seems to be on the streets. The government is either literally fleeing to another country or desperate to give in to the demands on the streets. This particular configuration, this particular style of protest, this very specific way of contesting the future of a nation or of the global system failed, at least in this case, to offer an answer. Failed to either take take power themselves, because it's very difficult for a group of individuals to take power to form a revolutionary government, or even to communicate to the leaders who were, if they did not flee, what they wanted or what, what, what they would accept in the way that, you know, a union leader might, or Martin Luther King might, or leaders of the civil rights movements back in the 50s and 60s in the United States, which really inspired the idea of protest and, and, and direct uh, uh, direct action, and at least uh, especially in, in, in my home country in the second half of the 20th century, in the ways that they would have had a clear idea as to what they would take in order to demobilize or what kind of outcome they actually wanted. And so in case, you know, you brought up the Hong Kong example, um, the, the word that was often used in Hong Kong was no stage. Uh, and that meant concretely sort of something that would have been similar to horizontalism and in South America or leaderlessness in North America, because there was a stage back in 2014. Um, and the people that were up there were often sort of representatives of some kind of some kind of organization. And Joshua Wong was one of those that became quite um, famous in the United States. In 2019, there was there was the idea among some people, again, 
not among probably the huge amounts of people that poured into the streets in the middle of the, the middle of 2019, but among some of the people that continue to be on the streets until the end of the, the year, that those people can't reject us often because they just disagreed with them politically. Um, they often were more anti-China. They were often more localist, often pushing uh, to a greater extent for some kind of actual independence from China rather than uh, increased democracy or autonomy within the, the, the PRC. And again, I, as I said, many, many people came to me with this answer that we were too decentralized, we were too leaderlessness, we were too leaderless. About like 50 people told me that they had discovered the same text, which is a really fantastic um, article from the 1970s called The Tyranny of Structurelessness by Joe Freeman. And what she says is that she was part of feminist movements uh, in the United States at the time that wanted to be leaderlessness. They were sorry, that wanted to be leaderless. They wanted to be structureless. But what she found over and over is that when you insist that there aren't any leaders, leaders, leaders emerge anyways. Uh, and in small groups, this may be sort of the person in the group that has the most social power, the most social capital, like the clique uh, of insiders that end up actually deciding everything for the rest of the group. Or in big, big, big movements, you might have leaders selected by social media or selected by foreign governments. So in 2019, um, while there might have been people on the ground demand, demanding that there was no representation, no leaders in the Hong Kong movement, well, certain people were sitting in front of the United States Congress and saying, this is what we, this is what you can do, speaking to the Trump administration, to, to Marco Rubio, um, saying this is what you can do to respond to what the Hong, people of Hong Kong are asking for. But actually, if you look at polling in Hong Kong, only something like 15, 20% of Hong Kongers ever supported anything like independence from the PRC. The vast majority of Hong Kongers actually um, wanted to be in the PRC. So the risk of insisting that you're leaderless is that you get leaders that are selected by you know whoever gets the most retweets or who gets selected by foreign media or in really extreme cases who just shows up with guns um, imposed upon the movement with very different ideas as to what it stands for and they end up exercising a leadership that is not accountable in any way in the way that you know a leader of a union can be recalled or Martin Luther King would have lost his position at the head of uh, his organization um, had he gone and done things that 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 uh, its members uh, did not agree with. That's that's really interesting the way you put it. And I do think then the crux of it just come down to what you've already said, that if you don't have a leader, somebody else might choose one for you in various ways. Then I mean, I do agree with you in that way that I don't really believe that certain movements can be absolutely leaderless mm -hmm. in a way. But yeah, I mean, also, you've given me something new to think about. So um, yeah, that was really interesting. Well, I mean, and, I would I would um, contrast. Yeah, sorry. I was just sorry. But I would contrast also a leader as like a charismatic guy or woman that is really in charge with just the idea of some representational structure. So you can have you can have collective leadership, like a social movement like the MST, the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil. They have, to every state ha ha elects two representatives. So there's 80 people that sit and, and, and mediate between the mass of, of people in, in the group and the and the, uh, and the government. There, it doesn't have to be like a leader in the sense of you know, the, the charismatic leader in the article that you, you discussed. It's, it can be something that is more, that is more sort of decentralized and less about a single individual, but often, often that single individual is imposed in, in moments of chaos. Whereas if you can get together and choose who you want or what kind of a leadership structure you want, it often will be a collective leadership structure or, or, or a rotating leadership structure. That's, those are other options too. Sorry to, had to jump in. No, no, not at all. And I mean, I, I do think Wendy Brown had a very interesting um, sort of take on this whole charismatic leadership where she does say that you do need a leader at the end of the day in order to sort of um, make politics more, e even more approachable also to people mm. um, and also to sort of mitigate bureaucracy of structures and connect with people. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's Wendy Brown for you. Yeah, I but think. also it's also, you know, Martin Luther King, right? I mean, a lot of people in the 2010s would have insisted that we we will never have we will never grab a charismatic spokesperson and, and elect and 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 
um, put him or her forward to represent us. But they all would also say it was amazing that Martin Luther King did that, exactly that, <laughs> or that it was amazing that the Black Panther Party had sort of a centralized uh, structure, which will allow them to speak on behalf of the, the group. Yeah, and I also think like a lot of hesitation about uh, having having an absolute leader also comes from the recent examples such as Donald Trump, right? Um, yeah. Which was collectively uh, elected uh, by the majority in the US. He was, he was, so. he was, he was. I mean, I think, you know, the tyranny of structurelessness is, uh, I think, a real tendency and you can't, you have to deal with it. If you often, um, when you have concrete leaderlessness, you often get hyper leaderism. This is something Anton Yeager talks about in his new book is that, you know, movements with no structure whatsoever often give rise to like a single figure that sort of speaks for the whole group in a mystical yeah. sense. And um, so that's a problem. Tyranny of structurelessness, structurelessness is real, but so is the iron law of oligarchy, right? Every time you create an organization, yeah. it you might find yourself in a, in a situation where the top of the bureaucracy cares more about holding onto their position, the bureaucracy than the original goals of the movement. I mean, again, these are difficult questions. These are difficult things to deal with, but you can't, as I said with media, you can't snap your fingers and, and get your get, get out of them. You have to, I think, create organizations which are both firm and flexible, and that's very hard to do, but I think it's the best way forward. Yeah. And I mean, I don't even know why I went as far as the US when I live in India and we have Narendra Modi. <laughs> there you is go. Who is soon going to be for another term this year. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. I mean, there's yeah. history is like history is it's very so this is something I want to make also clear uh, in the book and here. It's very understandable why a lot of activists um, and um, revolutionaries, even at the end of the 20th century and early 21st century, especially in the global north, but all over the world, looked at the 20th century and thought, oh, well, there was too many leaders. The, the big problem is leaders. We need, you know, it's all it all. I, it's, I'm very, I understand where all this come, come from, comes from. It comes from, as I said, a real ideological and a real material place. The good organizations seem to have been decimated. It's only the bad leaders that rose to the top. It made a lot of sense to try to insist on a, a movement that was fully leaderless. It just ended up not actually being fully leaderless in the, in, in the final outcome. Yeah. And people looked back on this and said, well, if we had had a mechanism for choosing our representatives, we would have chosen better ones. <laughs> yeah, true. Okay, so uh, the last question of our discussion, um, which, I mean, coming back to your book, um, you know, after reading it, it was just really, it was really nice to see that interviews within itself form such an integral part of the book. Um, your conversations and how they've spanned, you know, five continents, numerous individuals, and um, them being really, really honest about their experiences with you. I think it, there was a lot to learn about solidarities, especially for me, and I think especially an internationalist solidarity. And my last question to you is, how do you envision the future of this international solidarity, keeping in mind the times that we live in, um, the genocide in Palestine, mm. um, you know, the protests happening in New Delhi right now, as mm. we speak? Um, you know, are there any challenges that you see or any uncertainties that you feel journalists will have to mitigate or even activists themselves for like to work towards an internationalist solidarity? Yeah, I think there is a challenge, but luckily it's not that difficult to evade. Um, but no, I'm a big believer in the reconstruction of internationalist projects. I mean, I'm a, like a lot of my work features and sort of like, you know, elevates in kind of a nostalgic, but also optimistic way. Some of the more inspiring movements of the 20th century. I think like um, the Bandung moment is a big part of um, my first book. Um, and in the second book is often about the difficulty of revolutionary change in a more fragmented and um, um, individualized global system. And so what I found in my uh, the research for this book, at least, um, is that, and this goes back to your first question, social media made it very easy for people to be inspired by other people that were taking action around the world at like one second ago. Like you saw an acceleration of the re reproduction of words and images 
Um, and, you know, this already happened in the 60s and 70s. Back then, they were dealing with television and newspapers, and this really changed the speed at which people could be inspired by their movements around the world. But by the 2010s, it was like a split second. And this inspiration, is, I think, is a great thing. And I was at this, strangely, at the center of this, this, this <laughs> these dynamics, like something that I posted in Sao Paulo went viral in Turkey. And then you had this like back and forth exchange between um, protesters in Gezi Park and downtown Sao Paulo. Um, and so I think it's fantastic to take advantage of the communications tools that are at our disposal now. But a slippage that happened, a um, something, a phenomenon arose that a lot of people now consider to have been problematic or an error. And that is this inspiration sort of transmutated into actually just copying and pasting tactics. So not only were people really, really inspired by Tahrir Square, which makes a lot of sense because it was hugely inspirational. If you look back at what it, what was happening, it's hard not to be moved now, even if you know how it ends. They weren't just inspired by that, by the people willing to risk their lives for a better world. They actually just tried to do the exact same thing in different national and political and economic contexts. And a lot of people told me uh, in my book uh, that they wish that they hadn't done that, that they wish that they had more carefully studied the weaknesses of their local enemies and the best way to attack them given lo local conditions rather than just to allow inspiration to become the reproduction of tactics. So how do you get around that? How do you take advantage of the, the tools at your disposal? Well, I think the answer is like pretty simple. And I'm going to go back to MST again because I spent a lot of time with them last year. Um, the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil, what they do is they, they use the internet and they use the tools available at their disposal not to observe activists, militants, revolutionaries in some other country, but to talk to them. So no, rather than talking about or consuming images produced by movements here or there, like directly in, like to enter into direct dialogue and learn from each other, like have actual conversations rather than just be inspired by, watch uh, some other revolutionary or uh, social movement as if it's like a movie, as if it's like a movie. And so the MST actually, you know, they have, they have the means at their disposal. They're not like a rich organization by any means, but they like bring people from all over the world and they have, you know, they sit together for weeks and they have courses together and they, they exchange tips and tactics and information. And, and it's, and it's not just about the, it's not just about solidarity. It's about an active exchange of knowledge that takes place through dialogue, um, which is something, you know, hopefully that uh, you and your organization help to facilitate. Um, but that's my simple answer. Talk to people rather than about them. Uh, engage with people rather than consume them. That's really well said. Talk to people. <laughs> and it's, I an, think it's a classic one, yeah, but it's 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 right there. Yeah. And I do think uh, conversations like these need to be constantly ongoing and they need to evolve. and. Um, and it's like a small part of what we try to do at the internationalists. We try to sort of bring people from different movements um, so that they can also tell uh, tell us about their experience and how their experience might inspire others. So, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And it's been really rewarding to be able to speak with you today and pick your brain on all of these questions that were just just inside my head until now. Thank you so much for having me. And really, I really truly appreciate the interest in the book. And I appreciate that you agree with me uh, that the interviews are like the most interesting part of it. I mean, I I don't know anything. Um, I try not to put forward any sort of organizational or theoretical innovations of my own. I think the heart of the book is is the interviews that I did and and, and the things that people have learned and the insights that they have sort of, you know, uh, sharpened in their heads over the last 10 years. So I really thank you for your, for your engagement. Yeah, I mean, after reading so many interviews, it also, sometimes it tends to sort of feel like I am in a bubble, when I'm sort of talking about movements that are happening in India, or even in South Asia, but it mm. just helps to know that there's a precedent for, you know, things that we are experiencing right now. 
and the things that we are experiencing right now might in the future um, have a similar effect on other people, you know, scholars mm. and activists. So, yeah, interviews were amazing. So, and I, 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 it's like I, the one part that I really enjoyed reading after every chapter. So, thank you so much. Right, thanks again. Um, yeah. Before we sign off, I would like to request our readers and listeners to share and subscribe the internationalists with their friends. Uh, by doing that, you'll enable us to host more conversations like these and as well as help build our Progressive International.